I'm a tissue viability nurse at Leeds um, and I'm also a researcher. So I did actually look at my, my PhD. I looked at heel pressure also. So it's something that I've got a real passion about. Um, and I do think it is a often sometimes like a little second second thought, you know, with the heels. Um, where really actually it's something that we do really need to think think more about and um, and concentrate on the heels. So why is the heel actually such a high risk area for pressure ulcers? So we all know that, um, you know, the sacrum, the buttocks, they're often reported as being the most common places where we get pressure ulcers. Um, and that is well known. And that's often where we do a lot of the focus of what work on. But actually the heel is often reported as the second most common site where you get pressure ulcers. Um, but not only that, it's often where we tend to see the most severe types of pressure ulcers. So we really need to sort of think about, about heels. Um, when we're looking at doing pressure ulcer prevention. So what is it about the heel that makes it such high risk? So when you look at the foot in general, um, the foot is a really well-designed structure. So um, the foot is designed to withstand a hell of a lot of pressure. Um, if you think when you're up and you're walking, um, the structure of the foot, we've got this really large, thick um, fat pad to the base of the foot, um, which is designed to withstand all of our body weight. It can, you know, it's there, it takes the shock from the calcaneum, the heel bone, when we're walking, when we're running. So it's really, really well stru um, structured for that. But actually, when you've got someone that's lying down, if you look at the back of the heel here, um, there is not very much between this calcaneum bone here, this heel, which is actually, when you look at it, it's quite an unusual shape. It's quite sharp, the bone shape. Um, and the fat pad does not extend very far around this area. So we're looking at it. We've got not much padding over the back of the heel here. And then also the Achilles tendon, which is the largest tendon in the body, it fixates, um, it anchors to the, um, to the calcaneum. Um, and tendons, a bit like fat tendons, they don't have a very good blood supply, so they can be very vulnerable as well. So this whole area, when we've got, if you're thinking when you're lying on your back, it's not designed to withstand all of this pressure. When we're upright, it is, but it's not um, when, we're, when we're back. So what is it about the heel that as well that it makes it high risk? So when we think about risk factors, so Perfusion. So obviously, if you've got less blood flow to the to the skin, to the area, you're more likely to get a pressure ulcer. So we know that. But if you think about a lot of the conditions that we look at, um, so peripheral vascular disease, heart failure, um, the heat, the foot, the heel, it's the, the furthest part of the body away from the heart. So if the heart's not pumping well or there's something that's blocking the blood going down the leg, then we're going to have less blood circulating in the foot and that's going to mean that you know it won't take as much pressure um, to get that ischemia in the in the skin and um, in the underlying structures um, it could also be um, medications can be affecting the perfusion so if you've got if you think of like patients on critical care um, where they've got inotropes those kind of medications the whole idea is they're increasing the circulation to the heart and to the lungs and to the brain the vital organs that we need it and actually um, that's where you know the circulation to the feet and the, the legs um, often um, lose out because of those reasons um, and you think you know if, if a lot of the problems that we, we see with patients the first thing they say is they've got the, um, with heart failure they've got cold feet because they're not getting that same amount of blood so that is that is going to make the the foot and the heel more at risk of pressure damage. Um, diabetes, we all know diabetes is a risk factor, but actually why? If you think the reason, um, when you've got persistently high blood pressure over long periods of time, what's actually happening to the blood vessels um, is that the, the sugar causes the, the blood vessels to harden and narrow um, in the lower limb and especially in the feet. Um, so that gradually reduces the amount of perfusion, the amount of blood circulating in the feet and in, um, to the heel. Um, and it can also lead to structural changes in, in the actual feet and actually the bones. You know, we hear about Charcot's foot um, and other conditions like that. So again, diabetes um, can cause a massive problem um, and a risk factor for heel pressure ulcers. Not only that, does high, these high blood pressures in diabetic patients, they can also affect the nerves, um, which leads to neuropathy. We, of, we often talk about peripheral neuropathy. Um, so 
that um, means if you can't feel anything in your foot, you don't know that you're getting extra pressure going through that area. You don't necessarily know that your heel would, where you'd normally feel that your heel's getting sore because you've been sat in one position for a long period of time. Um, you don't get that with the neuropathy. Um, but other factors that diabetes affects, it, um, it affects the body's ability to control the oils and the moisture to the skin. So they can, um, the skin can become more vulnerable because of those reasons as well. Um, and like I've said with the, the diabetes neuropathy, um, it's not just with neuro, neuro, um, diabetic patients. Um, patients, alcoholic patients with excessive drinking, that can lead to um, long-term neuropathy problems. Um, so, you know, it's really important to think of those patients as well. Have they got, um, what is their circulation and what is their sensation like in their feet? Um, if they've had physical damage to the nerves, so if they've had surgery to the lower limb, that can affect their the sensation to the feet. Um, and then other neurological issues like stroke, um, the patients will, will again not have that, sens that sensation to the feet and that cue to tell us that we need to move more. And then edema as well. Um, if you think you've got an edematous limb, um, it makes it harder for the person to move the foot because it's heavier. There's more weight going to be going actually through the heel. Um, and the tissue is going to have like decreased oxygenation levels um, because of that extra fluid going through it. So these are all other things that make the heel at risk. So when we think about um, risk areas, we, we need to think about how we're positioning our patients as well. So when we're looking at patients who are in, there in bed, if they're laid completely flat like this, Yes, we know that the sacrum's um, going to be an at-risk area, but also um, the heel's going to be a really at-risk area. Um, by profiling the bed, um, so when we, when we lift the head of the bed, what happens here? It makes it more comfortable for the patients, but actually the more likely to slide down the bed, where, so we're going to get extra forces going through the ischial and going through the heel. Um, and again, we're going to have those friction and shearing forces as well, because the patient's going to be um, sliding down the bed more. So that makes them more at risk. Um, so profile in the bed, that's a simple thing that we can do, which is going to help reduce that risk for the patients. When we're profiling the bed, if you think what we're doing is we're increasing all of the different contact areas for, for where um, the, the body that's in touch with the bed. Um, and that in itself, it reduces those pressure points, but it also stops the friction and shear. It makes the patient less likely to lie down the bed. And then also, if you think when you see patients and they're lying in bed, it's natural, this bottom picture here, is um, the, the natural position when you're laid in bed is to have the heel externally rotated. So again, that's the sharp part of the calcaneum there. Um, and it's still not got that same level of um, fat coverage over the foot pad. So um, that sort of sideways foot drop almost, that external rotation, um, it makes them, you know, a lot of the pressure also, you see, they might be on the outside of the heel, not just at the back. Um, and then positioning as well, it's not just about when we've got the patient in bed that we make them at risk. We need to think about when the patients are sat out in the chairs as well. Um, if patients haven't got the right size chair, we know that, you know, the posture is a big thing for sitting out and um, it makes um, the patients more at risk of getting pressure ulcers through the sacrum and through their ischials. But actually, you know, if patients aren't sat up well, then they are likely to put, get pressure going through their heels as well. Um, when we're sat normally in a chair, um, it's estimated about 19 to 20 percent of our body weight is still going through the through our feet. So that's quite a lot, even when we're sitting. So if you've got a patient that's not actually sitting um, properly, you know, with a good posture, with their feet flat on the floor, that 20% body weight, it can increase. And then it can go through, um, not necessarily through the bottom of the foot, through the fat pad, it's going through the heel. So this little lady on the on the left, how many times do we see this in hospital? The patient's falling asleep. They've got the feet crossed all that pressure is going through the outside of the heel. And especially if in hospital or um, a lot of the care homes and things they have, they don't have cushioned floors, do they? They're really rock solid, hard floors. And um, so that's a lot of pressure going th from the hard floor through the heel. Um, the gentleman on the right, the cartoon, um, again, he's fallen asleep there. He's got his heels out. Hasn't, so all of his pressure is going through his heels. And then we've also just um, this gentleman in the middle. He's sat here with his feet on the um, 
on the buffet. We know that that's not, not a good position to be sat in, but you know, that's often how patients are be, be getting themselves comfortable. Um, but this isn't a great position in either because, you know, again, all that pressure um, when the feet is elevated is going through the heels. So, you know, when they're elevated like that, really the buffet should be going under the under the calf, um, you know, and having the, the heel offloaded rather than sitting in that position. So how do we need to prevent, how do we prevent heel pressure ulcers? So again, just really need to think of the heel slightly differently to the rest of the body when we're assessing the risk. Um, and have those conversations with the patients. Do they have any pain, any redness or any altered sensation to their heel when we're doing these assessments? Um, are there going to be problems with friction and shear? So, you know, we've looked at the pictures before of the patient sliding down the bed, but it's not just that, you know, a lot of the time the patients will be push, using the heel um, to propel themselves up the bed. Um, and that's causing a lot of friction and shear. So that's going to make the heel more vulnerable. Um, can the patient actually move the limb? So we've talked about, you know, neuropathy. Um, we've talked about lack of sensation, but actually have they got a paralysis? Um, have they got nothing, no reason that they can move that? It could be that, you know, if they've got a fracture to that side, they're not going to be moving that limb at all. So obviously, if it's not moving, the more pressure is going to be going over an extended period of time. Um, and like we say, like I've been talking before, really think about those comorbidities that the patients can have, really need to understand what the risk factors are. So, you know, have they got peripheral arterial disease, diabetes, have they got the perfusion issues and the sensation issues, because they're all going to make them at risk. Um, so to prevent them, it's not rocket science, really, you know, we talk about it everywhere. Um, the key to, to preventing pressure ulcers is to either remove or reduce the magnitude of the load. So how, how is the best to do it? So positioning. So when we're, we've got a patient in bed, we're very good at getting the patients in and doing the 30 degree tilt, but the number of times I go around and see patients and they've been tilted to the side, but the pillow is just under the buttocks, you know, or just under the shoulder, in which case what's happening is the patient is, you know, we're, we're lifting the sacrum off, um, off the bed slightly, but the heels are staying in exactly the same position. So we need to make sure when we are repositioning patients, when we're doing the 30 degree tilt, it's the whole body that is repositioned, not just um, the upper body. Um, obviously, when we're putting pillows underneath heels, one of the big keys is um, don't hyperextend the knee. Um, so the picture before with the man sat with his feet on the, the footrest, that's a big no-no as well because we're hyperextending the knee. And it's theoretically that because when you hyperextend the knee that um, it, it's compressing the popliteal artery, so the big artery that goes around the back of the knee, and that can actually increase the risk of DVT. So it's always good to make sure that, you know, patients have got a slight bend in the knee. Um, if the patient's got foot drop, that really needs to be addressed because that's going to check that changes again the structure, the structure and um, the circulation in the foot, making them more at risk of getting heel pressure ulcers. Um, and if the patient doesn't tolerate or um, able to stay in place, you know, if we're, we're offloading with a pillow, if we're, you know, re trying to reposition, then that's where we need to sort of start thinking about devices and what else we can do, what can we do differently to get um, the patient's heels um, so that reduced pressure or free from pressure. So devices. So again, like I was saying before, cornerstone to pressure ulcer prevention is to reduce the duration and or the magnitude of pressure. And that's including um, pre um, normal pressure and pressure with shear. So mattresses and repositioning are key. You know, we we know that it, it's our bread and butter, isn't it? You know, we make sure that the patient's on a pressure relieving mattress. We make sure that we've got that two hourly or whatever, you know, whatever repositioning that we can manage. Um, but it's always that thought then if, if the patient is still getting red heels, they're still getting um, painful heels, or we know that, you know, they're, they're more going to be more vulnerable, then this is where we've got that, that extra string in our bow, as it was, that we can then use a device to help reduce, um, to prevent the um, heel pressure ulcers from happening. So 
what is the evidence behind these devices? Um, this is this is sort of a big bit of my research and what I'm doing at the moment. And actually, there's not an awful lot of evidence out there. All these market, all these devices come on the market, um, and they come out with a few case studies. And there's not an awful lot of actual research evidence behind it. Oh, sorry, my slides have automatically moved on. Um, but what we need to um, we need to look at is. Um, you know, we know that they do work. We have that idea that, you know, offloading is key. Um, but, you know, there are other options out there because offloading is not always um, the best for the patients. They don't always like it. So there are different devices out there. So there's ones that we, we call offloaders. So these are the ones where the, the heel is actually elevated. It's floated within the device. Um, there's other de devices that um, reduce the magnitude of the pressure. So the amount of pressure going through the heel. So the cushioning pads, the gel pads, fleecy pads and then there are also some devices out there um, that work through reduction of friction and shear so it's really sort of trying to get that um, decide what's best for your patient group um, there's not enough evidence out there to say one's better than the other um, but you know it, it, it's trying to sort of have a real think about why your patients are at risk and what what is best that we can put in place to help reduce that pressure so going into a bit more detail about the different devices so there are um, some of the devices out there, they're reusable. Um, so the benefits of that is they're cheap. You can clean them. They can be used between different patients. Um, and they do provide that full offloading. So the heel should, be, if they're in the right position, should be completely free of pressure. Um, the, the, obviously, the cons of them is because they are reusable, they need to be cleanable. So they're often plastic, made of plastic um, or some similar substance so that they can be cleaned, which does mean that patients sometimes find them hot and sweaty. Um, and they, there are different versions. There's some that, you know, you can actually fix them to the limb. There's some that um, that don't, um, but, you know, they don't always stay in place as well. But, you know, this is a really good, cheap um, option for being able to offload patients' heels. Um, and then we've got single patient use ones. Um, so there's lots of different brands out there. I'm not promoting one brand over another. You know, it's um, it's just a device that is going to be fixed to the heel that, that again, it offloads the heel, it elevates. Um, now, the, these devices are really good because they often, they're, they're well fixed in place. Um, then they're very cushioned and padded. Um, and so they protect not just the heel, but the, the ankle bones and the rest of the foot. Um, but obviously, um, there's always a pro and a con for each of these devices. So the cons being that um, they are single patient use only. They can't really be washed and reused. Um, so if they do get soiled for whatever reason, then they'd need replacing um, and we can't share them between between patients. Um, some patients don't always like them as well. Sometimes patients find them hot and sweaty because they are really bulky and they find that they can actually restrict their movement in bed. So it restricts that independent movement. Um, and also, we, we, they're only really designed to be used in bed. Um, if a patient sat out um, or more likely to climb out of bed, then that they could become a falls risk because um, they're not designed for being walked in. So, you know, this is again where I'm sort of saying I'm not advocating one device over another because they all have their place. Um, but you really need to think specifically for your patient groups. And then we've got gel pads. So. Um, we see these a lot. Theatres often use these kind of things. Um, and again, they don't offload the heel, but they cushion it. They reduce the pressure to the heels. Um, so they're often single patient. Um, there's different types The ones in theatres that can be reused. There's ones um, that are single patient use, but they can be washed um, and then replaced between the same patient. Um, they can be fixed in place with socks or with shoes. Um, but some of the ones that we've seen that they the problem is because they don't they're not breathable they can make the heel sweat and cause maceration to the skin so they often need to be they can't be on 24 7 they need to be taken off for at least an hour a day to let that let the skin dry out and um and and be able to breathe um and then there's these other types that aren't necessarily offloading boots they're um cu again cushioning so they reduce that magnitude mag reduce the magnitude of the pressure um but these are often really nice um people often quite like them because you know the staff often like them because they're they're cheap yes they're disposable again um 
but you know when when they're only you know i think some of them are about five pound a pair you know compared to you know 80 pound for some of the other offloading boots you know they are a cheap option so if the patient doesn't like them you know you don't feel like you've wasted a lot of money um so again they're not fully offloading they're just reducing the pay reducing the pressure they can be tight they are, they've got straps so they can be attached to the heel um but they don't always stay in one place um and you know they can often patients can kick them off but you know again this is something else that is an option that you can you can look at so other devices so if if the issue with the patient is that actually it's friction and shear is the issue rather than actually pressure um, then this is where some of these other devices might be um, might, might be a, um, an option. So, you know, if you've got a patient that for, has got a tremor, for example, or they're just very agitated and they're moving their legs a lot, um, then, you know, what we want is then to be reducing that friction shear. They don't necessarily need to be offloaded. They're probably not going to keep an offloading device on the heel. So this is where, you know, we can be using like the multi-layer foam dressing. So, um, you know, and again, I don't want to be brand specific, but, you know, there's the Mepilex, there's the um, Alevin, there's the Biotape, there's lots of different of these heel foam dressings. Um, and because they're multi-layers, um, they, it um, reduces the pressure and the shearing forces but under the heel. Um, so there's not really any evidence about actually if they reduce the pressure to the heel and if they reduce pressure also incidence, but um, I do think that there is a place there if friction and shear is a, a, is a factor. Um, it's something that's used less. A few years ago, we were really pushing use of film dressings because, you know, you can still see the heel um, under a film dressing. Um, but again, it's, it's protecting the heel from friction. And then there are other de de um, devices out there like the parafrictor. Um, which again, it's not something that we routinely use, but it is again, it's something that could be these little booties um, that can be used to help with patients with agitated um, agitation who rub their feet. Um, so again, that's something that is an option that could be could be used. Um, and looking at the skin, so one of the things that we find, um, I don't know, you know, where where everyone works, but you know, something that I find when I go and see patients i get referred category u heel pressure ulcers a lot and i'll go and see them and it's not a pressure ulcer that there are other things that you can get that can, can look but also make the skin vulnerable so this first picture on here we've got really dry cracked heels um we get like fissures where the heels are really dry and sore and this is where um you know Again, the, they are going to be more vulnerable um, to heel pressure ulcers because the skin is already broken and vulnerable, but it's not it's not pressure damage. Um, the the next photo we've got like a corn or you know a veruca. Again, it's not pressure damage, but it's going to you know this, there is damage to the skin there. Um, we can get really dry um, buildup of skin on the on the heels as well. Um, so that really dry edematous um, or macerated skin, again, it's going to be um, going to make the patient more at risk. Um, and then this final picture on the right here. So we've got an ischemic foot. Um, so this is where, you know, the patient, because it is over a pressure point, um, and it has got that poor, not, not as well perfused area, they are more likely to get um, pressure damage there. Um, but it's often a bit of a chicken and the egg sort of situation, what's caused the damage is it the lack of blood flow for it so the ischemia or is it because of the pressure that they've got um they've got the damage um it's you know so it, it's not always easy to tell whether it's a pressure ulcer whether it's an ischemic ulcer whether it's a diabetic foot ulcer but you know they they can all cause these serious wounds to the heel um but again it might not be necessarily be pressure damage So in summary, um, best practice is if the heel, if there's no pressure going through the heel, they're less likely to get pressure ulcer to the heel. So if at all possible and it's safe for the patient, you know, we should try to offload. It doesn't necessarily need to be with a device. It could be with a pillow if we can manage it effectively or a wedge. There's so many different devices out there. Um, we don't necessarily know if one's better than the other. Um, as with everything, education, collaborative care, it's always going to be um, the best best way to get a patient to to, um, to work with us. 
um, and to make sure that they're aware of what we're doing, why we're giving them these boots or whatever um, product we're using. Maintaining posture, so that's not just in the bed when we're sat out in the chair. Um, good skincare, so again, clean, dry, good moisturisers always help. Um, and act on pain, altered sensation. Uh, you know, we've, I'm sure we've been having the talks about um, darker skin tones. They don't get that same um, redness to the he um, to the heels or to anywhere on the skin. So really act on pain and um, and that change in sensation. And if you know, feel if the he heels feel different, they feel a bit boggy. That's all signs that there could be something going on there. And and just a little tip there, like use of mirrors. Mirrors are brilliant. They've been a game changer, I think, in the last few, few years that everyone's using them. Best way to look at heels because rather than having to get down on your hands and knees and look under people's heels when you're on the um, when they're sat in their chair, um, but just something to get and really helps you look at the heels more. So that's everything from me. So thank you very much. Thanks, Claire. That was great. Um, <clears throat> If you wouldn't mind just uh, stop sharing, that would be great. Yeah. Fabulous. Um, yeah, I, th I think like you said right at the outset, I think the heels sometimes are not, or there might be an afterthought, or not maybe considered in a, in a way that they should be. Um, what's your thoughts on what I've, what I've found in the past is people might have been on a pressure-relieving mattress of some sort in the bed, and people people feel then they don't need to use additional offloading devices for heels. That's quite important to consider that, isn't it? Yeah, and I think um, one of the things I was finding when I was doing a lot of the um, talking to nurses and everything, it's almost like, you know, those extra devices are almost the third, third string in our bow. So, you know, repositioning is always the first thing we do. Then we're looking at the mattress, so having the air mattress. And then, like, you know, if we then still seeing pressure damage or early signs or we're thinking the patient's at risk then that's where we then need to get onto using these other devices um the mattress is a great there's a lot of the air mattresses that will have like you know the extra pressure relief at the foot of the bed designed to protect the heels but at the end of the day we still see patients getting pressure ulcers even when they're on these mattresses so you know that extra um care to the heels is needed on top of that I think that all goes down to your risk assessment, doesn't it? Looking at the, the risks of getting heel damage, whether it be peripheral arterial disease or restless legs or the, you know, totally immobile in bed and and, and the heels are down. Um, yeah. the, you're, you're, you work in an acute setting. I, I'm very much, I worked in the community and the problem that we had was when you felt you needed to offload heels rather than maybe using, uh, you know, something to reduce shearing or, or friction um they were often devices that would i felt increase risk in terms of patient safety so people who are living on their own they needed to get out of bed in the night to go to the loo and you've put them into some offloading boots or you know their, their mobility is restricted because you put these boots on i mean what what's out there that that can help with that and, and what's the role in your your experience of maybe getting podiatry on board to help with that sort of thing yeah i mean i i've less experience in the community but definitely we've we've sort of seen um issues with um these devices you know especially if they're fixed to the heel they are going to become a false risk you know if the patients are starting to mobilize um so you know i've seen it in the hospitals where you know if you've got a confused patient that's trying to climb out of the bed and they've got these devices on um, then that can just cause them to slip and to fall, um, which is why, you know, we, we sort of very much, um, when we're saying about using these devices, it's just purely for when the patients are in bed. So I suppose if you've got a patient that is mobile at home, um, it's a case of can they remove the device themselves? Can they put um, put something else on? Um, you know, and, and if they can be offloaded with pillows, you know, then that can work. But again, they can then just get kicked out of bed and um, I've, I've heard people say before, you know, they've, they've had patients where they've tried to offload the, the heels with a pillow um, at home um, and the patients knock them out of bed while they've been trying to get out of bed and then they've fallen over the pillow. So um, there's not much I know out there at the moment that's really good for patients mobilising in. And I think that is something I've spoken to some companies and they are looking at, you know, devices that where patients can actually mobilise in them. Um, but there's nothing yes. that I'm aware of at the moment. 
No, and I think a lot of the ones that they can mobilise in are, aren't ones that you'd want to go to bed in. Um, yeah. They're great for sort of walking because obviously we're trying to keep people mobile as well. So you've got, you know, OTs or even us saying, you know, you, we need to keep people moving because we need to do that. That's good for them. But it increases the risk to their heels because they've got heel damage. Um, it's tricky. And some, some of the offloading devices from what I've seen when people are sat out in the chair, because really they're designed more for when you're in bed, the heel ends up getting forced down through the gap um, and they're not totally offloading. So it, it, it is a big problem, I think, um, in the community with maybe, unless there's been some developments I don't know about, um, you know, we always struggled a bit getting the right device. So if anyone's yeah. out there today and you know of some really good, please share that information. That's that's brilliant. And I think, you know, from what you've been saying, um, Claire, particularly around the posture and seating, I think this just reflects the the need for this is like a multidisciplinary approach, isn't it? So it's yeah. it's getting an OT involved or a physio in helping to with that seating and posture. Yeah, because it is getting the right chair for the right patient. You know, it's um, it's going to make them less likely to get pressure sores to their sacrum and their ischials. But also, you know, it's going to protect their heels if, you know, we can get that good posture. Um, and it's wheelchairs as well. You know, the number of times I see patients mm -hmm. and they've got their heels mm -hmm. resting against the kick plates in the wheelchairs. And it's just, you know, uh, you know, it might be that they're paraplegic and they can't feel their heels. But, you know, the, mm -hmm. that, that's going to be a massive problem. So, you know, it's it's really important to get that good posture. Yeah, getting damaged to the malleoli, isn't it? Because of their, their feet sort of on the 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 sides of the wheelchair, um, yeah. where the, the arms come down to the plates as well. Uh, there's a question here or asking for an opinion from Vanessa about uh, whether foot pumps, for example, the ones that are primarily used for circulation as opposed to pressure relieving boots, are effective at offloading pressure. I've been told they are because there is a small layer of foam between the foot and the bed, but sh but not sure this is being contradicted by a, a TVN. Uh, I'm not quite sure um, whether you're what you're talking about here. I mean, I'm thinking of things like the um, Floatron boots that help squeeze calf pump. I'm not sure if you're you're referring to that specifically. If you wanted to take yourself off mute Vanessa and uh, clarify are you there to do that yeah because it's not something that I've, I've necessarily seen too much I know there, there used to be some of the the Legos uh, um, devices that you used to get that you know yeah. improve the circulation but I've, it's not something I've used for a long time to be honest no Hello. And I haven't known Hi. it used for Oh, so go on, Vanessa. Oh, sorry, I found the unmute button. <laughs> um, yeah, they are the Flotrons, and they're the ones that, rather than the full calf ones, they just go on the heels. And I think because oh. they they create a, a barrier between the bed and the foot, I think there's just a difference of opinion depending on who I've spoken to about whether they are actually effective at offloading or whether because there's still a your foot still in contact with a relatively rigid surface, they're actually not useful to offload pressure. So I was just wondering if like obviously try and get an expert opinion on that would be really useful. Right. So so they they're, they're just sort of foot flowtrons. Um and and it is around the purpose of circulation because that's quite can't quite get my head around that unless it's around activating the foot pump because as you know there's a, you know the podiatrists will talk massively around the matrix of vessels under the foot and how that sort of helps as well as venous return as well as the calf pump but i haven't heard of anything like this that's been used for pressure offloading yeah um, I think they're, interesting they're... so yeah we'll have to we'll have to look into that thank you for uh, raising that um any recommendations for offloading devices for patients with a tight leg contracture so I think that's where we really need to sort of get the physios and the OTs involved with yeah. that. So there are lots of different options. So um, if they have, you know, um, if it's like foot drop, you know, there's like the profo boots out there that can use it. But if it's a case of a patient that's really got the leg bent and, you know, you can't um, can't straighten their leg at all, um, then this is where often it's just having to get um, like the gel pads because at least then you can sort of fit it between the heel and the, you know if it, if they've got the knee right you know the foot right up towards the bottom, at least like the gel pads it's something that you can get in between 
um, or just using pillows and pads really. But um, that's really sort of one where we need that MDT approach um, to find the best best product mm -hmm. for them. Yeah, yeah. Um, if patients are mobile, or they or if, if patients are mobile or sitting for long periods, unless you mean immobile, maybe, um, Catherine, do they need an assessment by podiatry for offloading um, and or footwear? I would have thought it'd be based pretty much on risk, would you, and their sort of medical history, do you think, Claire? Because yeah, I mean, they seem to have quite a tight criteria for who they'll see, don't they, really? Yeah, so I know, like, for in our trust, um, the podiatrists um, will only see patients if they're diabetic um, and generally at risk. Um, so I think that's something where we would sort of be expecting, you know, the nurses on the ward to just be able to assess that level of risk and to implement the devices themselves. Um, and yeah. it's only if, you know, like, for example, you're having particular difficulties you know with the patient keeping the device on or you know like with the um contractures or something like that that would then sort of be looking mm -hmm. at referring to podiatry but i think you know if it's just a case of the patients at risk um it should just be any anyone really on that's looking after the patient should be able to do it yeah so i think there's reference here to the total casting you know that the podiatry do but i think it's worth you know having that conversation if there is that risk there because i don't think all oh the podiat oh you are a podiatrist fantastic um i am a podiatrist and advise that they should get an assessment by podiatry as early as possible if they are mobile or they can get out of bed i assume as if you if you've identified catherine that they are at risk uh, or they have pressure damage i assume i agree and i think there's huge amounts of work additional collaboration now i think with podiatry i think we used to be very siloed in the past uh, and i think your involvement in in pressure also prevention um you know it's essential that there's this collaborative working isn't that but there has to be really clear referral pathways and criteria so if you're not sure what the criteria is for you folks out there in terms of accessing podiatry for things like total casting or podiatry assessment, uh, do find out because they are an invaluable resource. Um, yeah, I agree, Catherine, you know, she says about a delay uh, to get these patients seen. There, there are delays, there's delays all the time in the NHS, but I think it's about that early assessment and getting getting them into the system as soon as possible, isn't it really? And I think that's um, why, you know, some of, some of these like cheaper devices, you know, that I was going through some of the different options, they're something that, you know, anyone could get what get hold of them, you know, the community nurses, the nurses in the hospital, um, and get something in place while waiting for um, that referral to podiatry to happen. Um, because I really think, you know, it is, get, it is important to get, get you guys involved and have um, podiatry on board and, you know, they can get lots of different different options out there but yeah it's um it's having that something in place before it's all about prevention isn't it so getting something in place as soon as possible yeah and finally which is it's something i'm interested in is you mentioned in some of your images there um claire around you know the maybe the presence of oedema in a foot as a risk so what are your thoughts on the use of compression therapy uh, because sometimes we're in conflict, aren't we? We've got, well, you can't put that on because it's classed as pressure, but we know actually how it works, that that's not all, it's not the case. So what, what's your experience or thoughts on the use of compression therapy when people are at risk of pressure ulcers or maybe, maybe needing an offloading device of some sort? Um, I think, you know, compression's really important and I think we should have patients being compressed where possible. We do, I think some of the problems we have, especially when patients are in hospital, they come in and they've got compression bandaging on and then no one's actually looking at the heel because no one wants to take the bandages off. So that's where, you know, some of the problems I, you know, I see um, come down to that. Um, but as far as, you know, from a pressure point of view, I think it's like anywhere that, you know, as long as you pad, pad the heel, you know, um, you put in padding, you know, we know that the shin bone, um, that pretibial area is often vulnerable, but we just make sure it's padded. It's the same, you know, with the heel and, um, you know, it, compression works because it's improving our circulation. So, you know, compression is, is needed. Um, but it's just having that, again, having that fore plan in, in place and knowing when we're going to be changing the bandaging, making sure that people 
actually look at the heels when they are redressing um, the, the legs. Yeah, good advice. Thank you so much. That's the end of that presentation, but that's really, really useful information. So thanks again, Claire.